Good day, everyone, and welcome to episode number four of the Australian Rock Show, Oz Rock's loudest and proudest music podcast. My name is Dennis Gray from the Rockin' and Rollin' Gray Brothers. Today is the 31st of January, 2015, when this show is being recorded. John Brewster needs no introduction. His songs, most obviously with the Angels, or Angel City for our American listeners, have influenced generations of rock fans and musicians from Guns N' Roses to Nirvana to our very own Screaming Jets, Airborne and many, many others. A few days ago, on the 27th of January, it was my great pleasure to interview John and he shared in great detail certain moments of his musical journey, which started with the Beatles, Bob Dylan, through of course to the Angels, Party Boys and his former outfit, The Bombers. John also brought us up to date on his current activities, such as the Brothers, Angels and Demons show, and of course what the Mighty Angels have in store for 2015. Before we rip into the interview with John, let's get in the mood with some Angels. Here's the title track from last year's Talk the Talk album. G'day mate, my name is Dennis Gray, welcome to the Australian Rock Show. Oh yeah, g'day Dennis, how are you? I'm very well thanks. Look, um, firstly I must say congratulations on four decades with the Angels, 40 years, it's uh, an amazing accomplishment and, and surely in those earliest days you could not have envisaged the band lasting as long as it has? No, I guess not. <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks very you much, know, I appreciate it. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, I must say it's very exciting for us to be um, still doing it and still doing it so, you know, and so well, if I do say so. Um, well, like in my opinion, and, and many others, still better than others. You know, most others. But you know, many of us, John, were born and raised with the Angels, and um, t- yeah, you know, as you just said, to have you guys still out there on the road, kicking ass and releasing vital new material—not just new material, but vital new material—I want you to know that we appreciate it and and feel very fortunate that you that you are still out there doing it. Yeah, thanks a lot, Dennis. Yeah, I mean the. Uh the two albums we've done with Dave uh, mean a lot to to me and Rick, you know, or well, the whole band, really. I mean, you know, we just mm. and and when I say the whole band, I mean it really it really is the whole band. It, it, it's a real band. It's not like we just hired a couple of guns on drums sure. and bass. It's you know, my son Sam, of course, is playing bass, but of course, talk, take it to the streets uh, was <clears throat> recorded with Chris Bailey. Mm. Uh, who sadly died and it just came out two years ago mm. um, uh, and he actually did play on Talk the Talk as well he played on uh, I think um, five of the tracks and Sam played the other other seven so you know he, he leaves a great legacy and Absolutely. Um, Sam really busy. studied his it- style too well, they're, they're busy days for you. I mean, you seem to be touring harder than ever. Not not quite as hectic as the seventies and early eighties, but <laughs> you, you. I mean, you are very busy these days, aren't you? Yeah, I mean, you know, we're doing um, uh, maybe four gigs out of season in June. We're doing London on the third of June and the Swedish Rock Festival on the sixth, and I think there's a possibility of Toulouse and, and Munich in the on the Thursday Friday. So I mean, that's that's really. Um, it's good to, good to be busy, yeah. Look, like many fans, uh, I was shocked when I heard about your heart attack back in 2008. How is the health these days? Yeah, thanks for asking. It's uh, great. I, I had a big scare, obviously, and it was mm. a bit more than a scare. It was a quintuple bypass, so you know that's all the arteries you got. So mm. it's life changing, that isn't it? Yeah, you know it is. Um, and I was very lucky, um, and I, I feel. So sad about people like Doc and Chris, who of course succumbed to uh, cancers and tumours and mm. stuff. And you know, the, the, uh, mine was dramatic, but it can fix a heart problem. You know, um, mm. arteries, you know, blocked arteries, are, you know, they'll take you out of the game, but um, they can fix them. Yeah. And uh, uh, I'm actually, I'm actually healthier now than I was, you know, six years ago. So it's, in a way, it's a positive thing to have that um, to have that warning sign. Yeah, yeah, I'm just very lucky. I'm, you know, I'm lucky yeah. in many ways in my life. I've, you know, just this Friday night we're doing this sellout show in Adelaide with um, uh, you know the Brothers Angels and Demons show, and um, 
it's sort of all about the family. It's a bit, you know, I guess we talk about ourselves. It's a funny thing talking about yourself in a way, but yeah. But, but, so uh, the, the, the band, the, the band includes your three sons. Yes, uh, it does. Sam, yeah. Tom, and Harry. Okay, yeah. I haven't had it. Haven't had a chance to see the show yet. And correct me if I'm wrong. So, it's it's a retrospective four decade journey of the Brewster brothers, enhanced by media footage, I guess, sourced from key moments over your career. That that, that sounds like something for me. Something a savor. Can you elaborate a little yeah, on what yeah, listeners could expect? Yeah, well, you know, we we don't we we there's a lot of still photos of of you know me and Rick as kids and and then you know Rick on the um, you know or, or I should say our grandfather and my father and who were both professional musicians and and um, it's kind of a story about how Rick and I we're really going very different ways musically and then came together in a jug band and we do some of the jug band songs and uh, Spencer Treglana, the Moonshine Jack and String Man Banjo player is going to come on stage. And, um, oh, hang on, where, where are, we, are we talking um, Adelaide here at the moment or are we talking... Um, <clears throat> well, I'm just, I'm just at the moment just chatting about Brothers, Angels and Demons and um, mm. I guess, I guess, you know, that's... Your, your sons, you know, they were. I imagine they were all raised, immersed in your music. Um, how does it feel to look around and, and, and see them on stage with you? Is that must oh, be mind blowing? It, it is. It's, it, it's amazing. You know, it's like it, it's both uh, a, a huge thrill to have my boys. You know, we, we're close. We're, we're good friends, and you know, I think, I think music's a wonderful thing. It, it, it is a bonding thing somehow. Absolutely, um, yes. And and but. But to realise just how good they are, you know, yeah. I mean, wow, they are just fantastic musicians, and 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 uh, there's a unbelievable. I mean, when I play in the Angels, it's it's like a well worn slipper, you know, uh, mm. and and I don't have to think. Uh, got you know, Nick Norton on the drums is unbelievable. My son Sam's playing bass. What a rhythm section! And then of course Dave Gleason, yeah. and he does his thing, and he's he's amazing. Um, and and so I'm in the I'm in the comfort zone with the angels, and generally with most of others I've never been quite in my comfort zone because I'm kind of a reluctant lead singer, um, <laughs> and so you know there's more pressure on me in that way. But there's something yeah. about playing with the boys, with my sons and and Rick, you know, this whole <laughs> five Brewsters, that is just so easy. It just feels yeah. so easy, and so you just tend to focus on. You know the song, and to me, to me, the best you can ever you can ever be on stage is when you're actually in in the song. You know, you, yeah. that the song actually means something to you as you're singing it, and yeah, so it's not just you know showbiz stuff. You know, you're actually in there, and I think Rick and I could probably say that we've more or less always been that, like that. Mm. I um I hope to get to um. My, my brother and I, uh, we're going to uh, get to one of the Sydney shows. And uh, for listeners, I can tell you that Brothers, Angels and Demons is coming up at, um, well, this Friday you're in Adelaide. Yeah, this Friday in Adelaide and then the following at Sunday at the Camelot Lounge in Marrickville. Camelot in Marrickville. Yeah. yeah. And then you're at Lazotte's in D1, Sydney's North. That's the one I'm going to get to. Yeah, that's but, on the um, 20th. Unfortunately, yeah. Lazotte's gig won't have the rear projection because they don't have the facilities. Okay. but. But right. the, the storytelling will, will be there. You know, we, we don't do too much talk because it's a music show. But sure. we, we'll have a, an MC who will ask us questions, and most of the questions I answer. Um, and, nice. And you know, it's like it's good. Uh, well, uh, I, I know it's good, uh, and other people are telling us it's good, so that's great. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask if? Um, Brothers, Angels and Demons includes a look at the work you did with um, the Party Boys and the Bombers? No, look, it doesn't really. Um, yeah, no, we don't really get into that. Um, okay. It's really... Uh, if, if I was telling my story, I probably would. Yeah, fair um, enough. But it's it's really a story, in a way, about the family, me and Rick and... and and, of course, you know, we're like being hand to baton over to the younger generation that who, mm. who think our music is cool enough to play with us. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll, um, I'll touch on the Bombers a little later. And yeah. uh, funnily enough, uh, John, I'm interviewing Tyrone, Tyrone Coates um, from the Bombers 
uh, in a couple of days. So such an amazing vocalist, and he had and still has such a huge voice, you know, across between I reckon Swanee and Barnsey, and maybe more if you want to add a superlative in. But um, oh, um, would you speak to him? Can you give him my best? And um, most certainly, yeah. But um, yeah, like the um, the, the bombers was a uh, was a great experience and um in particular when we did the Alice Cooper tour where so we were playing mm. in stadiums and and Tyrone Tyrone's voice in the stadium is something to behold. It's yeah. just amazing. And you know, I think we wrote some great songs, uh, made a really good album. Um it Absolutely. actually got a five star review in Kerrang magazine in London. So it yeah. was all just kind of Looking great for us. Unfortunately, the rug got pulled out from under us by A and M selling the company to Polygram. Yeah. So we got well, we got um, sort of caught up in a corporate takeover and kind of, along with I believe thirty other acts, got just you know dumped on the side of the road, you know, which, which was a, a bit of a tragedy at the time. Uh, but you get over these things, and you know the career mm-hmm. is. Been great, you know. It's, it's, it, you know, any when you play music, it's, you know, there's a roller coaster involved, really. I mean, some not all times have been, uh, have been great. There've been some, there's some ups and downs, tough times along the line, along the way. But overall, it's been amazing, and and these days, it's incredible. It, it is, it is, and congratulations uh, on the Talk the Talk record. We started this show um, with, you know, the killer title track, which I think. And it's not a small statement. I think it's one of the best things the band has ever released. Thank you very but much. You're welcome. But one of my other favourite tunes is, um, we played it on last week's show, is I Come in Peace, which is equally outstanding. Can you tell me how that track came about? I can, because it's actually a song that Rick wrote with Ross Wilson, who I think is one of the great songwriters. Yeah. Um, and uh, he wrote that song with Ross many years ago. Really? Um, yeah, and we demoed it. And then all of a sudden, Joe Cocker, did it and Joe, Joe, I think that's some. It's 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 a it's fantastic that that Joe Cocker, who's somebody that we've always really admired, mm. uh, chose that song. I had nothing to do with writing it, um, but Rick did, and and for Joe Cocker to have recorded that, and then sadly, you know, he's passed away, so we're very sad about that. But uh, it's it's lovely that the one of the final things that he did was record. Ross and Rick's song, and, and um, mm. we decided, well, you know, that's going to suit the Angels too, so we, we wanted to put it on the Talk to Talk album. So you um, you, you touched on Dave before, um, Dave Gleeson up front. It, you know, it, it is a great fit, isn't it? And personally, um, I've noticed this on the, the times I've seen you with Dave. I don't think you could get a better front man after Doc to drive the Angels forward, and I think he's not trying to be anyone else other than himself, is he? The, I mean, yeah, I couldn't have put it better than you just did, Dennis. Because that, right. that's exactly right. I mean, he he just he just brings himself to the table, you know, and yeah, all of the party, I should say, I suppose. And <laughs> and you know, uh, he's a great guy. We, you know, he he um, he's just a really genuine, great guy. He's very respectful. He he's a huge fan. Um, yeah, and he sings those. Uh, that thing I'm saying, I said to you earlier about you've got to be in the song to to to, to do it right. Yeah. Um, so it's he doesn't walk on stage and go, ta da! Hey, it's all about me, folks. It's like I'm singing these great songs because he that's what he calls them. He he, he loves his uh, songs. And I imagine you um you wouldn't have had to um go through many of the older lyrics with him. He, you know, he he grew up with the band like a lot of us, didn't he? Oh, the whole thing started when Dave. Came to a Brewster Brothers show actually, and he was just down the front, you know, having a beer, and you know, up in the Adelaide Hills. And I kind of leaned over. I said, "Hey, Dave, do you want to get up and sing a few songs?" And, and he said, "I'd love to." And I said, "And yeah, let me think. Uh, do, do, do you know any Angel songs?" He said, "I know all of them." <laughs> <laughs> and so, sure enough, he gets up on stage, and and I, lo- I looked across at Rick because at that stage, stopping next to the band, and yeah. we had no real idea what where where the whole thing was heading, you know, like um and, you know, Rick and I wrote those songs and we just went, Oh well where's it gonna go from here, you know? Uh Doc had no intention of coming back and, and um I looked at Rick and he looked at me and he called me up a couple of days later and he said, you know, John, we've got to 
we got to ask Dave Gleason to join the band. And so I yeah. called Dave and he was knocked out. And the rest is history. I mean, we're coming up four years now. Yeah. So you never were considering anyone else as a vocalist? No, nah, not no. really. Um, sure. Okay, a couple of thoughts came to mind. It's not, no, so I won't even mention who they were, but okay. they, they wouldn't have, it wouldn't have been right. David no. was the right guy, and as it turned out, he he was able to do it, you know. Absolutely. And um, you know, he's still the lead singer of the Jets, and we pre- we appreciate and, and respect that. And you know, we do our Brewster Brothers thing, and the Jets do some gigs, and um, it's funny, you know, we're what? we're loving Brewster Brothers more and more. We've, There's a lot know, of planning, I imagine, with you know all those different bands involved. A lot of planning with the schedules of, you know, Jed's dates and Angel's dates and, um, you know, Bruce the Brothers' dates. It's busy. Yeah, we've got a good agent. <laughs> so yeah. the year is is busy with the Angels. You've got a couple of dates coming up at the Bridge Hotel in Sydney mm. next weekend. Some dates with Cheap Trick and Billy Idol and also a run of uh, dates on the Day on the Green dates too. So there's really no excuse for listeners not to take in an Angels gig soon. And I, I really do encourage everyone to do so. But um, And the, the dates in Europe you've got coming up, you mentioned Wednesday the 3rd of June 2015 at the Garage in London. Yeah. Saturday the 6th of June you're at the Swedish, the Sweden Rock Festival. And, mate, I reckon you're going to show a lot of those bands how it's done. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Yeah, well, you know, the band plays great. I mean, you know, I'm very confident in saying that. We we don't go through the motions. We play those songs like we no. mean it. Um, it's to me that the energy in the Angels is is, is very is similar to what it was like in the late seventies. Um, it is. How, how long how long has it been since the Angels toured toured Europe? Oh, yeah, thirty something years. You know. Yeah, I thought so. Yeah, because we did really well in Europe actually, but our manager um, chose to basically turn our back, turn the bands back on Europe, and we just focused on the States and Canada and stuff, and I think it was a really big mistake. Uh, but he made a few. <laughs> but anyway, we won't go there. <laughs> so the Angels, as is well documented, the Angels and Cheap Trick friendship goes back a long way. Yes, it does. Um, mm. 1980. So a, a different question for you, John. Being a, a, a Beatles fan, you must love some of Tr- Cheap Trick's vast body of work, you know, very, mm. very Beatle influence their sound. Mm. Um, great band. They're great the, band. And, and phenomenal. They're, and phenomenal. they're good guys and... You know, we became friends with the, with those guys in uh, 1980, particularly Rick Nielsen, because uh, we'd played in Detroit with them, um, then drove into Chicago, um, uh, checked into the Holiday Inn Lakeside, and the roadies parked the truck, and then the next morning went to get the truck, and there was no truck. Um, yeah. And, you know, we lost all our wonderful... Guitars, my gold top bridge, Paul. I still miss that guitar. Thirty-five years later. Um, where but, where um, did you purchase that? Can I ask? Where did you get that Les Paul? Where did I get it in Adelaide? Right. So you'd had it since you from you since since the early days. Yeah, I've used that guitar oh, right. to record the uh, face to face, no exit, dark room. A- um, and it got pinched. That was one which got pinched. Okay. That's, yeah. Well, they they took everything. They took you know we had a PA and truck and guitars and amps and the whole lot were gone. Yeah. So um, must have been devastating to lose that. It was. It was really devastating, but it was really heartening because um, Rick Nielsen heard about it on the radio and he lives in Rockford, Illinois, which is about seventy miles. I, I thought it was hundred and twenty, but I was wrong. It's seventy miles from Chicago, and he he just chucked some guitars in the boot of his car and drove into the Park West Club that we were playing that night. We had a sell-out crowd mm. and, you know, we were kind of going, well, what are we going to do? <laughs> and he just turned up all these guitars and another band loaned us amps and drums and stuff, so uh, it was great. Um, he loaned us... Uh, I ended up buying one of the guitars from him, but yeah, he just said, yeah, you guys help yourselves and use them for the rest of your tour. Great. Uh, it was Can't lovely. Get it was lovely. Than that. No, and then we toured um, England and France together. Uh, co-headlined in France, so that was a big deal for us because we had a hit in France with my song, uh, Mark Tapney Red of Marseille. Have you um, have you ever heard the tracks which Rick and Bunny from uh, Cheap Trick did for Lennon's Double Fantasy, the, the demos they did? I don't think so. 
because uh, as you you may or I uh, thought you would know, he um, Bunny and Rick um, demoed uh, you know the tracks like I'm Losing You and the other one Escapes Me, which ended up on Double Fantasy. Not not the finished tracks. They, their their tracks didn't make the album, but I think there was a box set released um, probably 2000 maybe a oh, John Lennon yeah. box set, and it and it included those demos which uh, Bunny and Rick played on, and they're just um, phew, they're phenomenal. I, I wish they had made the cut, but um, yeah, yeah, me too. That's a, in, great you bring it up. I'm just watching this thing on um, on George Harrison, which is really about the Beatles, but it, 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 the focus is on George, and and it's fantastic, just fantastic. There's, there's, there's one scene where one kids pulling another kid up onto a, a window ledge and I'm, I'm looking at it thinking that could have that might be me because that's where I was uh, okay so you that's know, that's Adela- Adelaide footage is it you're yeah, watching or... yeah welcoming, okay. I was welcoming the Beatles in July 1964 now I know that you slept out I, I read that you slept out three days for Beatles tickets yeah I did yeah yeah nice uh, nice yeah it's amazing I mean you know that that was as much a a great part of the experience as anything else, really. It was just Beatlemania, you know, like, um, and, you know, I was only 14. Our parents let us do it because it was just sort of safe, you know, and the queue went right around Adelaide virtually and we were up near the head of it. So Friday, Saturday, Sunday night, we slept there and and Monday the ticket box opened and had our tickets. That uh, that kind of stuff is life-changing, I, I imagine, um, yeah, that and seeing Dylan in 1966 for me, but they're probably the two great life life changing experiences. You know, I mean, with the Beatles, I, um, I was uh, uh, it was a lunch lunch time, and I, I was outside the school on a, in this little park. I don't even know why I was outside. I think I think there might have been a school function, and then I had to walk back to school. And I was in this little park, and I had a transistor radio. And the, and the radio jock came on and said, I'm about to play a song from a band from Liverpool, England, that everyone's talking about. And he played Please Please Me. And at that moment, well, just like, I just heard this thing leaping out of a little tiny transistor radio. And mm. it just blew me away. I, I didn't just like it. There was every part of my body was, had gone into goosebumps. And, fantastic. And I, I ran all the way to school. And I went into my classroom and all these guys were in there and I, I held up the transistor radio and then at this stage the song's long gone. <laughs> and I and I just held up my transistor radio and I said, Did anyone hear it? <sighs> and everyone's looking at me like I've gone nuts, you know. And and they're going, you know, what are you talking about? Except for about six other guys who said, Yes and we're all <laughs> talking about please please me and I swear to you, by the next morning they were the biggest scenes in sliced bread. That wow. it was it was like this wildfire, just went whoosh, and suddenly the Beatles were just you know huge. That's and of course, um, Adelaide was the, their biggest public reception ever in yeah, anywhere absolutely. in did the you, world. Did you attend that? Did you attend that? Absolutely, the, the and all reception? the headmasters, okay. and all the headmasters and uh, headmistresses of the school, of various schools around the place said, so, you know, anyone that goes to welcome the Beatles will be expelled. Well, you know, we mm. all went, so they, they would have had. Tough time surviving as schools if they'd expelled us all. <laughs> it was amazing. <laughs> well, it was just incredible. They played. Um, was it Centennial Hall in in Adelaide? Yes, I did. Yeah. What, what was the sound like? Um, uh, what sound? You, <laughs> okay, so that answers that answers my question. And just just uh, um, drowned out by screaming well, girls, is, is my well. Two things. I mean, you would dream these days of, of using a public address system that. They use. I mean, the the thing was big enough maybe for the Lord Mayor to give a speech at a garden party. <laughs> sure. I mean, uh, it was ridiculous, ridiculously small sound system. Um, that's that's the first problem, and then the second problem was that the girls just drowned out. That's the, that's the interesting thing about the Beatles, actually, is that their music was so incredible. The songs were so beautifully crafted, and and their and their harmonies and. Just the way they played, it was just a, it was a complete thing. And yet, the very people who were making it all happen for them, you know, buying their records and turning them into the biggest band in the world, mm. didn't listen to them. Mm. You know, they come along and just scream. 
Yeah. You know, I'm sorry, I'm being sexist, but with <laughs> all the girls, the girls just screamed. And it's like, well, okay, you know, well, at least we know you. they like you. <laughs> Why didn't they just <laughs> scream at the end of the song? But they screamed all the way through the song. And all they had to, all the Beatles had to do was shake their heads and the little mop tops yeah. just went. And, and, the, and the decibel level would go through the roof. There was only one thing I heard musically, which was Campani. That's it. That's all I heard. Okay. Campani. That was it. <laughs> Three words. <laughs> I didn't hear love because by the time I got the love, it just went berserk. Um, but you know what? The thing is, it was an event, and it was great yeah. to be there. And you know, and you know, of course, we had the records, and 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 you know, the whole the whole Beatles experience was amazing. And then, of course, along came the Rolling Stones, and and so many other great bands, and uh, and then, but 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 for me, before I got into the Beatles. Uh, I was already into Bob Dylan. I, I got into Bob Dylan in 1963. Uh, actually, it might have even been 1962 when he had his very first album out called Bob Dylan. And for some reason, I would got interested in Woody Guthrie. And then along came Bob Dylan. And I, I bought his album. I've still got it. The very first album. And then, of course, Free yeah, Wheeling came out in 63. Uh, and I... You know, I was playing guitar by then. I could I could sing most of Dylan's songs, um, and then he came to Adelaide in 1966, and that that was when he uh, it was the controversial time for Dylan because he started, you know, having the band backing him, and mm. I'm talking about the band, not a band, sure. the band. Sure. Uh, and he brought them to Adelaide, and you know, like I saw all that, and that that really did change my life. That more than the Beatles actually, because. Because really? uh, I was just totally into the singer songwriter thing, and and that just caused me to want to start writing songs. And well, I'm glad those. Uh, I'm glad you had those two moments because um, you know it helped shape your career and 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 ultimately the music which so many of us love. And uh, I'd like to play an Angels tune, and it's one of my all time favourites. Um, it's "You Got Me Running" from that first album in 1977. Oh, yeah. Really? Was that song kicking around for a while in the live set, or or oh, can yeah. you think back what, something you penned? It would have been in the old, in the very early days. Um, mm. you know, I, I, it's funny you should bring that up because I heard that recently, and I was just really thinking, yeah, that you know that little the middle eight of that. Yesterday I brought yeah. you flowers. <laughs> I kind of like that. Absolutely. Maybe you should bring it back in the live set. <laughs> Good idea. Do a good job. Let's play that. Yesterday I bought you flowers and in the night I watched them die. Here's some very early angels with You Got Me Running. Such a great song, that. <clears throat> the first of seven uh, Angel Studio albums featuring um, John Brewster, the last of which would be 1984's Two Minute Warning. I think, <clears throat> and I've, I've skipped over most of your career now, I'm sorry, time's, uh, haven't got much time today to cover you know, 40 years, but I think that Two Minute Warning album has some great moments like um, personally, Razor's Edge and the Look the Other Way track, but I've read that it's not a record you have fond memories of. Uh, John, can you elaborate a little? Uh, yeah, well, I, I can. <clears throat> um, I, I think that the uh, the album, I think the songs are actually better than what we ended up. Uh, this, my, this is my own opinion. Um, mm. well, we, you should hear some of the demos of it. Uh, I'd, I'd sort of done a deal with Martin Benz at EMI Studios in Sydney mm-hmm. uh, to, to record that album and and also write in Studio C, I think they called it, uh, and we, we, we yeah we wrote all the songs in there and and we were going to go upstairs to the A Studio, which is a magni or was a magnificent studio, with a big Neve desk and all that. And that's mm-hmm. where we were going to record the album. And then our manager goes, well, I think we should record it in, in Los Angeles. And um, and I said, well, I've got a really good deal going here at EMI. Why do we have to go to LA to record the album? And he said, well, we should be on the doorstep of the record company. Yeah, well, okay. <clears throat> the thing ended up out of control. We, it, uh, it, uh, it cost us uh, over $400,000. Wow. And so it, it sent us broke. Um, and the record company lost a vibe for it in, in the States. It still did really well here in Australia. 
Sure. Um, but, you know, that combination of that and the tour that was put together on top of it was really <clears> a disaster for the band. Was that with Was that with Triumph? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so we went into some of our, be- our best areas where we'd, we'd really, you know, knock them dead, you know. I mean, like Portland and Seattle, for example, were huge for mm. us, which is one reason why, you know, bands like Pearl Jam, Nirvana, I know, you know, Kurt Cobain was into the Angels, and, yeah. you know, because we, we kicked huge goals here, and then we went in supporting that stupid bloody band Yeah. Um, that were actually well, a I mean, di- dinosaur act that would in their death throes. What a mismatch. And they yeah. treated us like shit. Really? Yeah, and they treated, I mean, you know, we had about four lights on us and the PA turned down a half volume and it was yeah. just, you know, like it was insulting. It um, is. That, that is. That's disrespectful to hear that after, yeah. you know, so all yeah, the work you were done. You probably hear me getting stirred up, but the thing is that <laughs> that actually caused my de- my demise from the band. I, I, I was so, di- uh, so disillusioned by the whole process of recording Two Minute Warning and, and then that stupid tour but mm. I became such a pain in the ass that the, bo- the boys ended up saying um, uh, do you think maybe uh, you want to leave the band and I said yep wow so I was kind of pushed but I also p- pushed myself out of the band so let's just say this is early 86 um, you joined the party boys sometime after was that was that just to rejuvenate yourself have a bit of fun after the way it ended with the angels um, yeah well I was um, Paul Christie called me and and he said, well, we're putting together a line of the party boys and it's got Alan Lancaster in it from Status Quo and, 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 and Angry and, you know, Kevy Boric, I've always uh, he's been a friend and I've always admired his playing and everything. And, and I wasn't doing anything. I, and I said, yeah, that'd be great. So, you know, that thing lasted, probably only lasted a couple of years, but it became... Very successful because it, uh, it was, uh, and I became a great friend of Alan <coughs> Lancaster, still am. And uh, we, I was going to ask you about that. Had had you met Alan previously? No, um, I hadn't. Um, but we just hit it off straight away. And I'd go around to his place at that stage, he was living at Double Bay. And I was, I'd go around to his place and we'd go up to his music room and and just we started writing songs together. And uh, some of them, which are on that Party Boys album, and um. And then Glenn A. Baker sent us a tape of um, various songs. Because the Party Boys, really, it's all about doing covers. And for me, that was a fascinating thing to do because I virtually, you know, spent my whole life doing, you know, our original music. Mm. And it was like you know, one of the one of the tracks that Glenn A. Baker had sent us was um, "He's Going to Step on You Again." And Mel and I were driving back from the gig, and we just played the thing in the car and went, that's a Party Boys track. And sure. Swanee had some sponsorship to do a single and at this stage Swanee had joined the band. And uh, we were, Al owned a recording studio so we went in and, and the two of us recorded the songs and then got Swanee in to sing on it and cetera, and the thing went number one. So all of a sudden Party Boys was absolutely on fire and it was uh, quite, quite, a, quite an experience. <laughs> Were you surprised by that chart success? Uh, you know, it's, um, Dennis, the first time in my life I've actually listened to a track when we were mixing it, mm-hmm. and I and making made a statement. I said this 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 track's going to go number one, and I've never oh, ever said that before or, or after. Um, I never said that about Angel tracks because we were although we had we've got a. a, a String of hits that we're not, we weren't really, never, we never really considered ourselves as so much a singles band. It was like an album band. No. And but step on you, I, I just picked something in and out. I just went, this, this is something special. And yeah. and you know, like from a commercial point of view, it's something special. And sure enough, it went number one. So I was a bit of a smart ass, wasn't I? <laughs> well, you're on the money, but I. I saw you uh, with the Party Boys a few times, and that self-titled album uh, you cut is is still one of my favourite albums. And I recall playing, uh, I remember playing that tape at my workplace back in the day, and when Gloria came on, a co-worker thought it was uh, ACDC. It, that has that much grunt, you know, the way yeah. it kicks off. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> it does. I agree. Actually, two of my all-time favourite uh, tracks you've written are uh, Is This the Way to Say Goodbye and She's a Mystery. 
Um, oh, they're both, yeah. both, both from that Party Boys period. Yeah. So is this, and, and I know that they ended up in um, the, the Bombers live set and, and rec- recordings, but is this the way to say goodbye ended up? Um, that was penned by Alan and yourself about Quara and the Angels, obviously. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, cause, the other know, track... The thing, the thing is, it's like... Pretty emotional thing when you, you know, you grow up in a band and you, you're like brothers, you know, and then something goes wrong and and it, it, it leaves some scars. I can tell you that. Yeah. Uh, but you know, did you um? Can, can I ask? How did you feel about um? This the success of say the Howling album. Not long after your departure, we you were surprised, happily surprised for Rick. Uh, well, I love my brother, you know. Uh, yeah. At that stage, I didn't have much love from anybody else in the band, I can tell you. Sure. Um, and, but, but I do now, you know. I mean, sure. you know, I, you know the doc, doc was very difficult, but, you know, we still loved him. So, um, but, uh, oh, yeah, I, I, I had mixed feelings because uh, one part of me was, uh, well, it was, Kind of, I don't know if jealous is the right word, but I was mm. happy for Rick that the that things were going well for him. Uh, mm. And I also thought it was a good album. I don't particularly like um, the next one, Beyond Salvation, but I think mm. Howling was actually really good. And, um, you know, there's some great things about that. I think Don't, don't Waste My Time is on there, isn't it? Or was that not? Yeah. Yeah, see that's really that's that's a great track, and and also they did a great job of we got to get out of this place. And but I must admit, um, being a little bit competitive, I I had a, a a great moment, which was when we got to get out of this place. I think peaked at number five on the charts, and and that's, he's going to step on you. Just let 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 <laughs> straight over the top of them to number one, and I went yes, nice. Brotherly uh, competition, I guess. But the other um, track I just yeah. mentioned, "She's a Mystery," features the distinctive uh, vocals of of Gr- Johnny Swan and um, the great KB Kevin Borich. I'm going to play that, John. Do you think you could uh, preface that tune, "She's a Mystery," before we air that? Yeah, it might have been uh, about maybe the first song that uh, on that caster and I wrote, mm-hmm. uh, and we recorded it with the Party Boys, and and then I. I'm not sure did, we might have even done that with Tyrone. I can't remember, but uh, you did. You, know. you did record that with Tyrone. Okay. Mm. Yeah, there are people out there that know more about my life than I do, <laughs> by the way. Um, <laughs> well, but, it's good because uh, um, not much research needed. Well, Al, Al had a studio, and and we'd sort of hit it off, and it was lovely to, for me, that having been in one band all all my life, and you t- you t- do tend to get a bit of tunnel view. Vision, you know, when you're particularly when you're young guys in a band, because we're hell bent on on success, and and so the whole thing's very insular. So to to start playing with different musicians was a great experience, and, and none, none more so than than our old Lancaster, you know, because we weren't just playing together; we were writing together. And she's mm. a mystery came out of that, and Al had a studio, so we would go in there and um, and record. Um, and that, from my recollection, is maybe the first thing we did. Fantastic! Mm. You know, it's a great, it's a great track, and uh, we're going to hear that now. Here's the Party Boys from 1987 with "She's a Mystery." I mentioned before, John, that I saw the lineup a bunch of times back then, including an outdoor gig in Sydney with Graham Bonnet up front. Was he ever uh, being considered to join the Party Boys full time? Uh, look, Graham. Joined the band when uh, we played a company with Swanee. Uh, mm-hmm. There was just a little bit of stuff going on, and Swanee moved on, and then decided he wanted to come back. Um, okay. <laughs> like a week later, um, and meantime, Graham joined the band, and we did um, I think over three or four gigs together. Uh, and I remember the rehearsals being just unbelievable. I mean, you could turn the fold back off and you could still hear his voice. Mm. Uh, very powerful voice. And he stayed with Alan Lancaster uh, during that week. And I lived next door to Al. And I remember 
uh, Graham coming into my music room one night. Uh, it was just me and Al and Graham Bonnet. Graham picked up one of my acoustic guitars and just sang Beatles song after Beatles song. And wow. it blew me away. He just did them so brilliantly. Um, but it, he was a kind of damaged soul. And mm-hmm. um, he was he was almost too good for the band. You know what I mean? It was like, uh, put him in a stadium and it's perfect. Sure. Put him in a pub sure. and it was like, it was a bit of, almost a bit too 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 much. Um, so, but he he was he was incredible incredible talent. Well, I, I guess looking back, I, I was fortunate. You know, I, I managed to catch a show with him. Oh, um, you did? Yeah, it, it was a, it was an outdoor show at Mona Vale in Sydney's north. Uh, I grew up in that vicinity, and um, yeah, that that was where it was on a sunny summer's day. It was brilliant. With party boys. Party boys, yeah, yeah, yeah. with Gra- Graham Bonnet. Oh yeah, great. Well, you know that. I mean, physically he was incredible. And it was good, good fun playing um, Baby Blue with him. I mean, I do Baby <laughs> Blue and the Brewster Brothers. <laughs> I, I love singing Dylan songs. But, um, well, he, oh. his voice—he has got an amazing range, oh, Graham Bonnet, incredible. no doubt. But so some time ro- rolls on, um, John. And correct me if I'm wrong. You and Alan spot an amazing vocalist called Tyrone Coates. At long lost Sydney live venue Sweethearts, is that correct? And consider him as mm. vocalist for the Party Boys, but instead decide to form a new outfit which would work on original material called the yeah. Bombers. I just wanted to talk about. Um, I could talk all day about the Bombers. I must have seen you live thirty odd times. Some of my favourite ever live shows by any artist were in late eighty eight, early eighty nine, when the Bombers did a run of Tuesday night shows at uh, Crow's Nest. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you had that intro long way to the top and I thought no one knew that better than you and Lancaster right what those lyrics meant and then bam the band just ripped into it so much power and energy and uh, great days choir angels and roadhouse blues I, I, I get shivers just thinking back to those nights they were great days oh that's kind of bad you experienced that because it was pretty amazing um, and you know we, we did we demoed some songs and that's, that's really why we parted company with the party boys because we realised that the Party Boys is about covering, um, you know, doing, you know, interpretations of other people's songs, etc. And 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 Al and I wanted to write songs, so so the party, so the Bombers became a vehicle. And and yeah. um, initially with John Cogman on the drums, and then Teddy Heckenberg, who just one of the great drummers. The, in the world. He is, but you had a had a tune called "Get Up and Get It On," which didn't make the album, but was great live. And I think, I mean, you've obviously got a vast back catalogue, John, of songs which are in the works, never recorded. But maybe Dave and the Angels should have a look at that. "Get Up and Get It On." Do you remember that one? Yeah, I do actually. I think it was really good. It, it was a ripper. It was get a ripper. Up and get it on. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. Like I was, we had some terrific songs. You know, "Aim High" is a good oh. song, I reckon. What about Escape? And I'm, I'm, before we go today, yeah. I'm going to play Escape by the Bombers. Yeah, um, such an amazing tune. Yeah, Escape was a biggie for me. Uh, I loved it. Yeah, we, there was a good period of writing, you know. Like, you know, we're, we're still proud of that. And, you know, as I say, you know, we're a bit victims of a corporate takeover. So you're still in you're still in contact with Alan Lancaster? Yeah, I see him right. um, when I get to Sydney. I don't live in Sydney anymore, but... Uh, mm. Uh, I get to see him, and uh, it's always it's always great. So, and I'm so happy that he's had a re- had a reunion with his old band. You know, it's great. Yeah, me too. Time heals all wounds, I guess. But mm. um, well, mate, we're gonna get. I think we've got to get Alan on the show. I know it's the Australian rock show, but he's pretty much one of ours, I reckon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, he, but, is, um, he is. He is. He's, well, he's lived here for thirty something years. So. Yeah. Yeah. Before before you go, you, you also produced an album in um, mid ninety four, maybe by Wayne Jury, who I really like. Yeah. Uh, called Walking Walking on Glass. Yeah. Um, w- how did that come about? And um, um, I just I, really really enjoy the album. I uh, met Wayne um, Steve Croft, who played in the Bombers, played lead guitar in the Bombers, mm. uh, also played in Black Cat Moan. That's right. uh, this is a blues band which uh, were really good with Bob Spencer and, yeah, and Peter Heckenberg. I saw Heckenberg. them live a couple of times. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, they just asked me to come along and play a bit of harmonica. 
so I did, and I got talking to Wayne, and I said, I said, what, what do you do with you outside of that? And he said, well, you know, I do, you know, write, write some songs, etc. I said, uh, you feel like doing something together, and and that's how that started. And we we uh, we wrote the that album, and uh, I produced it, and um, I'm pretty proud of it. It sort of you, you should be, you should be. It's a great album. Yeah, you know, it's, um, it should is. have done should have done better things, but um, oh yeah, I mean, you know, it was <laughs> it was probably a bad time to be signed up with Albert Simpson because they were going through changes. So you know, yeah. the thing is, Dennis, that part of what we do, you know, when you get, when you get down to the creative side, you know, it it can there's a lot of stuff that we've done that, that I'm really proud of that mm. didn't get really. Uh, commercial success through other reasons, you know, like didn't yeah. maybe the radio didn't pick up your single, so people just you know like wasn't so exposed. And that's why I think back to the old days of Countdown, etc. It was just amazing. And if you yeah. if you'd had the bombers, if Countdown had been around when the when the bombers started, I reckon we would have probably taken off pretty quickly um, because that exposure well, was huge. And radio well, stations, you know, I mean, demos would watch it. And, the the album is appreciated by a lot of of people around the world, and I think even as time has gone on, people are discovering it and and really enjoying it. But mate, we better wrap this thing up. And um, oh, it's been people, I encourage to you, Dennis, you know? thank you. I encourage anyone to go and see uh, Brothers, Angels, and, and and Demons, and the Mighty Angels are out on the road, so there's no excuse not to see them. <laughs> um, yeah, John, thanks for taking the time out today to talk to me. It is it is an honour for me to do this. I've been listening to the songs you have written all my life. And and your music is really important to so many of us. So uh, uh, thanks, lovely. mate. We'll see you on the road. Yeah, thanks very much, Dennis. Nice to talk to you too. I've enjoyed it.